solve. And last but not least, of course, you got an excellent definition of, of liberty. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to start off with a quote from Frederick Bastier. It seems to me that this theoretically right, for whatever the question under discussion, whether religious, philosophical, political, or economic, whether it concerns prosperity, morality, equality, right, justice, progress, responsibility, cooperation, property, labor, trade, capital, wages, taxes, population, finance, or government, at whatever the point on the scientific horizon I begin my researches, I invariably reach this one conclusion. The solution to the problems of human relationships is to be found in liberty. Away with the whims of governmental administrators, their socialized projects, their centralization, their tariffs, their government schools, their state religions, their free credit, their bank monopolies, their regulation, their restrictions, their equalization by taxation, and their pious moralizations. And now that the legislators and do-gooders have so futilely inflicted so many systems upon society, may they finally end where they should have begun. May they reject all systems and try liberty. So what is liberty? Liberty is the freedom to act with respect only to second and third party rights, slave only to those limitations enacted by the creator or nature. Breaking down this definition, notice that the word freedom has been used not as a synonym of liberty, but as a mere piece of the overall definition of the term. What does this mean? Liberty is not freedom, and freedom is not liberty. Certainly there exists a relationship between the terms, but the terms are mutually exclusive. One can exist with freedom in his or her everyday life and not enjoy liberty. Liberty is the complete ownership of oneself in action, while one can be a slave to others and still retain freedom. An example, a man imprisoned in his cell, does he possess liberty? Does he possess freedom? Let's answer the last first. This man locked away from the world and all he held dear retains freedom. Do not confuse his loss of liberty for a loss of freedom. No, this man possesses freedom, even as he is a slave. He is free to move about in his cell. He is free to think. He is free to breathe the air, to whistle a song, to use his toiletries, to read his books, and on and on. Certainly these freedoms could be further limited up to and including the ultimate restriction, which would be execution. But he retains a measure of freedom up to that point. But this man has lost his liberty the minute he was in prison. In order for this man to enjoy liberty, he must retain the freedom to act in any manner he sees fit with respect to the rights of others. If one is unable to act in such a manner, he or she has lost liberty while retaining freedom. Liberty is a state. And as, as true with all other states, think of a light switch, on and off, it only has two states. One either possesses liberty or one does not. The saying that a woman can't be a little pregnant comes to mind. She either is or she is not. One cannot be a little dead. One either is or one is not. The question then becomes personal. Do you desire to live in a state of liberty? I'm not going to stand here and tell you that mankind has ever existed in a true state of liberty because I'm not one to make wild claims with no verification or evidence of the truth. That said, mankind has periodically, periodically made great strides in an effort to make that state of being a reality, only to see those efforts erode over a period of years. Historically, this has been an observable truth. In the past millennium, we can note that beginning in 1100 with the Charter of Liberties in England, up to the American Declaration of Independence, there were many moves by the people to limit the authority of those entities which governed them and their actions. Sadly, we must note that this process has been repetitive. But why is this so? The arc of government is one that bends from liberty towards tyranny. This is, a, is an observable truth to the student of history. I would postulate that this occurs for a conglomeration of reasons. However, it is allowed to occur usually because there has been a period of time in which the enlightened view of liberty and what it entails has been purposely blurred. Instead of moving toward liberty and justice for all, the people lose their moral compass and allow their government to become a column that attempts to be all things to all people until it eventually enslaves everyone to a bastardization of collectivist thought. Frederick Bastier, the great philosopher and author of the law, gave us a simple guide to test whether or not a people were living under the tyranny of others via its governance. See if the law takes from some persons what belongs to them and gives it to other persons to whom it does not belong. See if the law benefits one citizen at the expense of another 
by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime. Does your government pass this test? This is a question that all who seek liberty must answer for themselves, but one thing must be clear. Liberty is a complete mechanism made up of tiny cogs of freedom. Take away just one cog and the mechanism does not work. It is for this reason that mankind should not allow the definitions of these two mutually exclusive terms to be blurred into a single unit. It is this blurring that moves the people away from liberty and into the waiting arms of tyranny. One would do well to remember that a liberated people and a liberated government cannot coexist. Where the void of liberty is ignored by one, it will be filled by the other. This simply means that one will necessarily be the tyrant of the other. One will be a slave and the other will be the master. One chains the other, always. It is up to mankind to remove itself from the belief that it is its government. As shown, nothing could be further from the truth. You are not your government, and your government is not you. Awaken yourself to this knowledge, and you will be awake to the difficult yet necessary task at hand. In order to claim our birthright, the people must remove itself, remove from itself those chains placed upon them in the name of government and use them prop to properly restrain the institution itself. Again, from Bastier. Ah, you miserable creatures, you who think that you are so great, you who judge humanity to be so small. You who wish to reform everything. Why don't you reform yourselves? That task would be sufficient enough. Although written some 160 years ago, these words are just as relevant today and form the core of this event tonight. Each and every speaker here has presented unto you an issue which threatens to swing the pendulum of liberty even further into the favor of those who seek to rule mankind. They are, in effect, speaking to the one person who can force such people to reform themselves, as Bastier suggests, you. You have a voice. It belongs to you and is more powerful when backed by truth in favor of liberty than you can imagine. But what is your voice? How and when can you use it? First, let me explain to you what your voice is not by telling a quick story. Recently, I was in conversation with a few people, none of whom I new person, about the upcoming presidential election. When someone within the conversation suggested that they would be abstaining from casting a presidential ballot, another stood aghast at what had been said. This person went on to exclaim that the right to vote is a person's voice. This struck me as perhaps one of the more misinformed statements I had ever been a part of. Your vote is your voice? How terrible would that be? A vote is but one very small component of your voice. To suggest otherwise would be to claim that your voice is to be heard once a cycle and then you are to remain silent in the period between. No, your voice is everything that you do and say. It is how you carry yourself, who you conspire with, what you buy, where you lay your head. Your voice is never ending and despite what others would have you believe, it is very, very powerful. Like freedom to liberty, your enlightened voice is the basic building block of true and everlasting revolution against tyranny wherever it is to be found. So, how should this powerful tool be used? The power of your voice comes from your ability to combine it with others to build its volume. When your voice is one in a sea of 350 million, it is muted almost to the point of obscurity, so it must be combined with others to be noticed. Each speaker here tonight has presented unto you an issue of freedom that is a component of liberty. Where we succeed with one, we move closer to the overall goal. Each of us come from different backgrounds and possibly share different views on the principles of governance. However, we have chosen not to focus on any possible differences. No, we have chosen instead to unite and celebrate our commonalities because each of us see more value in such an action. We are uniting our voices in the name of liberty and we welcome you to join your voice with ours. The power to reclaim one's liberty from the federal government cannot come until one's voice has been heard at the state level. The power to reclaim one's liberty from the state cannot come until one's voice has been heard at the district. And the district will ignore one's voice until it has been heard at the local level. And none of this matters unless you reform yourself. The outbreak of liberty must start somewhere, and that somewhere is within you. You are the basic building block of any movement. And as you work to combine your voice with others within your community, your 
friends, your neighbors, your associates, your family, you will notice the outbreak occurring. If you make the reforms, the change will come at each successive level. Your voice cannot be ignored unless you fail to grow it. You are in charge. The power is yours. The Liberty Outbreak has to begin with you. In closing, I would like to thank everyone in attendance for their participation tonight. I would like to thank my fellow speakers. Uh, I would like to thank Alan for putting this event together. I would like to leave with one final thought from Frederick Bastier. We hold from God the gift which includes all others. This gift is life, physical, intellectual, and moral life. But life cannot maintain itself alone. The creator of life's life has entrusted us with the responsibility of preserving, developing, and perfecting it. In order that we may accomplish this, he has provided us with a collection of marvelous faculties, and he has put us in the midst of a variety of natural resources. By the application of our faculties, these natural resources, we convert them into products and use them. This process is necessary in order that life may run its appointed course. Life, faculties, production. In other words, individuality, liberty, and property. This is man. And in spite of the cunning of artful political leaders, these three gifts from God precede all human legislation and are superior to it. Life, liberty, and property do not exist because men have made laws. On the contrary, contrary, it was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that men made laws in the first place.